Hello, everybody. It's the Silver 5150. I'm here with Silver Joker today. How are you doing, everybody? All right, guys. You know this is part of our ongoing collaborative efforts to try to figure out what the heck is going on and how we can take today's circumstances in the world and turn them to the stacker's benefits. The more you know, the better off you're going to do. Knowledge is power. So uh, the topic we're going to tackle today is an issue that has been going on for quite a while, and this is the subject of share buybacks, a practice that's been going on in uh, the global stock market since probably 1982 when the SEC authorized this uh, type of activity to take place. And share buybacks, if you don't know, they're just basically a way for you know CEOs to protect themselves from you know um, stock manipulations and stuff. That's how it kind of started out, but it's turned into much more than that. Um, it's turned into a thing now where companies can basically insulate themselves in total from um, you know stock uh, movements, uh, crazy stock movements, and now it's become a practice where they can maybe keep themselves alive longer by creating more fantastical numbers as to what their real valuations are. So the problem with this is that over time, it's going to turn into a, I'd say, doom vortex of unreality in these companies. And when the layoffs begin and the stock starts plunging, there's going to be absolutely nowhere to go for these companies. They're going to end up going out of business and people that have their value and their, their revenue tied into these companies, they are going to, they're not going to understand what happened. So we're going to go ahead and get into that today um, and start out in, uh, I guess I, uh, Joker, I want to ask you, you know, um, why does the idea of share buybacks bother you as one of the uh, premier stackers out there? Okay, well, first of all, just to be fair, is there any positive? I mean, I, what I don't understand, I guess this is basically where all my apprehension comes, or I guess my fear uh, in learning about this, this practice that these big businesses do, is I don't understand what would be the uh, underlying reason for them. What would be a positive um, in share buybacks? And if you can just share that with me a little bit. I mean, what what is the what what are they trying to achieve through share buybacks? Well, I mean, share buybacks are beneficial, um, of course, to those who are able to partake in them. If you have um, a position in a company, you can go ahead and you can um, you know create numbers in a portfolio that's going to look good, you know, in your profit margin. So when the quarterly numbers come out, you have to give these numbers out, you know, even if you're an individual shareholder, say a senior member of a company, um, it's very good for your portfolio. But overall, for the general public, share buybacks are good because a lot of pension systems are tied into the stock market. And as long as the stock market can maintain higher numbers, that's going to work for those pensioners. All right. And they can go ahead and um, make sure that they get um, a good retirement plan out of it. But the thing is, it has to be maintained. And I think we're coming towards the end of that. Another good thing about share buybacks is that um, it allows the companies to maintain a um, to maintain an image of solvency. And that helps them keep more people employed because, you know, they look healthy. And so they, you know, do these great numbers. And, yeah, well, you see, yeah. but, you, but you see that that still looks, it still sounds uh fishy to me. I mean, okay, I understand that. Okay. So, so like, I know I have, I have a 401k and I know it's tied into, uh, investments and that kind of thing. I understand that. I know that my, um, my, uh, portfolio manager that manages my 401k and some of the other things, I know that the company that does that, um, they invest in these companies. I know that they do that. And so I know that the companies, the companies, um, growth or how they look the positive nature of these companies helps my bottom line helps my my uh, 401k to grow or at least not to lose money okay i get all of that what worries me about this is is when you say that they um they want to make their portfolios look good they want to make the companies want to make their bottom line look good but it seems to me that that's built on something that's not actually tangible okay so they're doing this with these with these buybacks and this is i guess where my fear comes in and where my apprehension comes in and where i think it's going to be devastating for us is i think they're doing that with money that they haven't actually earned so the company is not actually doing what a company does a company is supposed to make things or whatever provide a service or whatever and that's how they get their revenue you know that's how the company goes now i know there's other 
more complicated things that I don't really understand it goes into a business actually making money, but a business has to actually perform some type of service or build some type of, of uh, product in order to make money. So if you're saying that you're making money off of borrowing money and then buying your own shares to make your company look profitable, seems to me that that is a very shaky, very unsteady, very unsustainable practice. Absolutely. Am I correct? Absolutely. No, you are You are spot on. It's a very slippery slope. And I'll even go as far as to say it's not even a slippery slope. It's a cliff. And I can tell you that we've already actually made impact with the bottom of mm. that um, cliff, or the bottom of that uh, that uh, gully or whatever. So my, the, the, the thing I want to explain about the share buybacks, and I was trying to put a happy face on it, but the thing is there's no happy face on it. You know, share buybacks in the, the iteration they're in right now, if I was to compare them to, say, activity I would take place in, share buybacks the way they're set up now, because we only know on the surface that they're they're doing this, they being the companies or the CEOs, being authorized to buy their own stocks to create the image of multiple members of investment or multiple layers of investment in that company to create the energy that looks like the company's done. It is basically um, the same thing as me uh, trying to, you know, spend the money that I have three or four times over to get stuff and then you know, expecting it to do what the original, uh, what the original notes, original uh, Federal Reserve notes did, you, you can't do that. Once you once you have a certain amount of um, once you have a certain amount of revenue, you can only get so much stuff with it. In the case of these these companies here, basically, it's it, the bad part about it is the share buybacks are bad. But what's worse is the actual funding that they're backed by. Okay. We had talked before about share buybacks, you know, being a bad practice because they don't reflect reality. These are companies investing in themselves. You, you can't sell something and then actually purchase the things you sell and expect to make a profit. It doesn't work that way. Right. However, it's even worse than that. The share buybacks are happening with borrowed money. Am I uh, correct on that? Yes, you are absolutely correct on that. I've been doing research. I've been looking into this and I'm going to tell you something that's even, you know, that's, that's like keeps me up at night is the money that they're borrowing is coming from the federal government who owns a lot of mortgages. Right. And these mortgages that they own are, uh, are themselves owned by, uh, uh, people who borrowed money. Right. You know what I mean? So you got a situation now where the economy is in such a state that people are not being able to uh, pay their rent. They're not being able to make their mortgage payments. And so that money that the federal government is counting on coming in on these loans that are not coming in on these loans is the same money that they've lent to these companies who then bought their own shares. So, you know, that's... (laughs) I can't. I can't even understand well, let, how that right, is even let, possible. Why? Yeah. Why would they even allow <laughs> that kind of that kind of business practice? So the thing is, let's dig into that a little bit, and let's dig into that. I like this. I like where this is going because what you need to understand is that you've got the Federal Reserve that has basically taken up the mantle of buyer of last resort. So the buyer of last resort, you know, basically is saying that whatever's not being covered by actual people investing in the company, whatever's not being covered by share buybacks, the Fed has a backstop for that, doing the very thing they vowed they'd never do, and that is to purchase directly out of the stock market. They're doing that. But the way they're doing it is they're not, you know, doing it, um, you know, firsthand. They're doing it secondhand. They're saying, hey, we've got a pool of money here, pool of cash. You guys can draw from. You can borrow this at almost no percentage of uh, interest. And you can use that capital to buy back your stocks. You don't have to actually take out of your own system to buy back the stocks. We have a pool of money you can draw from. Now, where does that pool of cash come from? The pool of cash comes from the monetization of debt. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with that, the monetization of debt is something that started happening probably around 2009 after the 2008 crisis. And it basically allowed the Federal Reserve to take whatever kind of debt we had in our books, whether it's the twenty-seven thousand, excuse me, $27 trillion of uh, notional debt we have right now in the United States, 
or the $250 trillion of unfunded, li unfunded liabilities we have here in the United States. And by the way, this is around the globe. It's not just the United States. I use it in the United States as a barometer. But it allows the Federal Reserve to declare, decree, to basically transmortify or transform these numbers of debt and say, hey, this is no longer debt. This is cash, and we're going to spend it. Mm. Yes. Now, this is why it gets really bad, because you have this cash that is really debt that we owe, and at some point would have to pay back if we really intended to pay it back. Now, so it's already funny money. So now you've got all this funny money, and you're sending it to, you're making it available to these companies to buy back their stocks. It's creating layers and layers and layers of insolvency. So not only are stock buybacks, you know, creating a false um, a false narrative as to the health of a company, it's being done with unhealthy capital to start with. So, I am okay. I think okay. I, th I think I understand what you mean. Okay, so this is this is kind of what I'm getting from what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a company uh, has to uh, bring in income. They have to bring in money. They have to bring in revenue in order to be a company and functions and do the things they got to do. I mean, they got to invest in uh, R and D, research and development. They got to pay their employees. They got to buy whatever they need to do whatever they have to do. They have to have money, capital coming in to do that. Right. All right. Now that that is separate from its stocks that it it owns. Now the stocks are pieces of themselves that they sell to just regular individuals right. who then give them money that they can use to you know further the company and do all these things that they're not getting from whatever they're producing. Okay, I I get that. So what I'm thinking is, and this is this is my own. And correct me if I'm wrong. Is that these companies are borrowing money from the government? under the pretext of doing that with it, of doing that, uh, investing in their in their employees, investing in research and development, investing in furthering the company's um, activities in, you know, that perf that they perform to earn more money, build the products or, or, or uh, you know, do the service, right. right? But instead of doing that with the money, they're taking that money and buying their own shares to make the company look like it's doing good, right. it's 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 making these strides and and producing and and uh, earning, and that right to me seems like it's not only like just baseless and it seems like you know kind of unethical, but it also seems like it may be illegal. <laughs> how can you how can you borrow money? Because I'm sure the government, I cannot fathom the government letting these companies borrow money to buy their own shares with right. it. Well, the, that, that can't be, I mean, am I wrong? Well, I mean, the, are they the, doing the premise I think is a little off, uh, Joker, and I think what we need to keep in mind is that there is no real disconnect now between government and industry, government and big business. It is all part of one uh, monetary complex now where you have the, the stewards, you have the custodians of our liberties and our laws that are actually in bed with these you know corporations and are bending the rules or skirting the rules in their favor because they benefit from each other mutually. We don't have a moral compass in our government anymore. Government has always been on a shaky ground of trust anyway, and I can tell you right now that ground is crumbled. It's not there. We're standing up in the air like Wiley Coyote after he goes off a cliff. <laughs> it, 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 it is insane. So here's the thing. Um, yes, what you say is true about what they should be doing with this funny money to keep their companies going or to even grow them and create a real, you know, a real growth, uh, you know, platform. But they're not doing that. They're basically just trying to stay alive at this point. They're just they're using that capital. They're doing all kinds of uh, economic voodoo, financial voodoo to keep themselves alive on paper when, in fact, they're crumbling. Now, now see, the thing is, you have to ask yourself. If this is the answer to a problem, then why isn't it working? It's not the fact that they're doing it that bothers me so much. Is that how abysmally, how abysmally this is failing? Is failing? So, give me an example. Mm. Um, share buybacks, you know, totaled about two hundred billion dollars in uh, Q1 of this year. So, you know, between January and March, you know, uh, share buybacks totaled about two hundred billion across the board in global industry in the first three months of this year. Now, that's actually down from last year at the same time 
um, from 205 billion, okay, and that was in 2019, and then it's um, down, you know, probably you know uh, 200. Let's see, down another 20 billion from that time, um, from this quarter last year. My point is, is that as we get further into it there's actually less for these guys to buy back because they're buying up everything. The corporations are buying up all their stuff. And unless they're creating shadow derivatives in the background to make more purchases to make it look like the company is bigger or has more stuff, they're almost at the end of the line. They're actually almost at the end of the line of these mm. of these buybacks. And that's really bad because they hit a wall yeah. at a time when we have 49,000 airline furloughs uh, and layoffs going off here this year. We got 28,000 laid off between Disney right. World and Disneyland just yesterday, for example. You know, the rate of right. business closures right now is, you know, 10% per month. And the current rate of uh, business closures right now is 54% here in the United States for the year 2020. You can't look at that evidence and go, this share buyback thing is, is a good idea and it's working well. It's not. It's failing abysmally. And it's as crooked as it's as crooked as, you know, um anything. And so um right. yeah, it's just all kind of coming to an end. Yeah, and I and I and I got to agree with you there because, you know, in order for anything to operate, it has to have somebody to either, you know, need a service and pay for the service or the product that they produce and if we uh the people who the taxpayer the people who are going to be buying their product or using their service if we don't have capital if we don't have uh if our financial situation has changed drastically to the negative where are they going to get that money from so really i see it as they have no choice either they fail completely or they um do what they're doing now with the with the buybacks in order for themselves to look good which to me it's obvious once you once you understand once you understand this is going on it's obvious because how can these companies look so good how can the stock market not be doing worse than what it is right. if so many people are struggling so many people are out of work so many people's jobs are in jeopardy because of what's gone on this year how can these companies still be reporting these gains how where where can they come from? Because I know small business are, is like the the biggest employer of of um, people in this country, and small businesses all you got to do is just read the paper and you know just 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 walk around my city. I walk around my city and, and there's so many businesses that are closed, yes. so many businesses that are just not open. I walk through the mall and the mall, especially this time of year, the mall would be packed. And there's just, there's just a, you know, there's, there's nowhere near, it looks like just a regular mall day when you walk through the mall and there's the food courts closed, they got these things. So how can these companies be reporting these gains? Where are they coming from? And that's right. where they're coming from. They're coming from borrowed money. Mm -hmm. And the only way I feel that they can keep this going now is to give us some huge stimulus. And that will kind of kickstart people or help people or motivate people to go out and spend some of this money to buy some of these widgets or you know get the services and how long can that last and see this is this is great because our conversation basically consists of two parts problem and solution we are bringing forth a problem and the problem is right. long term we're looking at everything that we've held dear value in paper being evaporated away by inflation hyper the solution is to replace it with something real and solid and what is that silver joker Silver, absolutely silver. Amen. Well, I, I will I will throw this in there that uh, at least in my city, um, silver is becoming harder and harder to um, obtain. The uh, the uh, generic silver and the kind of silver that I stack is becoming harder and harder to obtain. Now, you know, um, coin stores have it. Of course, they have it, but they don't have it in the amount that I that they used to have it. They don't have it in the variety that they used to have it. You know, you could go into a coin store around here anytime and they would have whatever you wanted, as much as you wanted. Now it seems like you have to buy kind of what right. they have, you know. And so I can already see that there is something not quite right with that situation there. I think there's a lot of people that follow me on that. I think a lot of people understand that there are things that are absolutely different in the way you purchase and buy and uh, get silver now. So I think that those things are not going to get any better. At least I don't see where they could get any either. better um, anytime soon. I would say buy as much as you can because you can't lose with that.
I mean, just consider that for a minute. You can't lose if you put physical silver in your possession, in your stack. You can't lose with that. Well, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, and I have a question when it comes to the value of precious metals. Even under the manipulated conditions we're in, when you think about it, you have a possible, we'll argue and say that we have 800 million ounce per year um, physical underlying asset being mined per year in silver. Yet you have a five plus trillion dollar paper market against it. Yet silver's price is still moving upward. You know how much downward pressure is required now to keep the price of silver lower. And so what we're dealing with is we're dealing with uh, supply and uh, you know demand and supply dynamics. The demand is going up, and that demand is creating these shortages or these this lack of inventory that you're seeing. And silver and gold and platinum will never go to zero. And if you got something completely destructive on one end and something that's been known for 6,000 years as money and is reliable, and even if it doesn't do anything exciting, just being reliable is all you need, then that is the play to make. Yes, and I'll agree with that. And I'll say to answer your question, what is the value? Civilizations, governments, all these things, um, they come and go. Silver and gold and all the rest of the precious metals have been around forever, and they're going to be around forever. They're going to be around long after we're gone. Uh, so, and they're always going to have that value. They're always going to, cause that value is what we mm. place on that, right? These dollars are depending on systems. They're depending on people. They're depending on things, uh, silver and gold. They have value outside of all of that. The intrinsic value is always going to be there. Silver, as long as it's silver is going to be silver and it's going to have silver value. That's Very just well the seen. bottom line. Exactly. Very good point, my friend. I mean, you, you nailed it. Look at it like this. This is how I look at it. If you got a Zimbabwean dollar, I don't know what that's even called. It, it's called you got a, okay. If you got a Zimbabwean dollar, right, and you got a silver eagle, you try to give somebody that Zimbabwean dollar, they're not <laughs> going to take it. They're, it has no value. Give them that eagle anywhere in the world and see what you get. You're gonna get exactly what you'll get in any one of those countries. That eagle is gonna have that spot price value. And I would say beyond that spot price value, but at least that spot price value wherever you go. So that is beyond governments, it's beyond systems, it's beyond banks, because that silver eagle or that maple leaf or that kangaroo or whatever is gonna have value beyond what that whatever country you're in wherever you are that eagle or that maple leaf is going to have that same value everywhere Absolutely. and you know the thing is people folks out there you guys are stackers uh i love you guys very much um you are just great you know participating in the channels and the comments and stuff understand one thing we are playing on a global stage this is a global stage yes you know your town you know your countries and all that but this is a global stage. Precious metals are a global market. Silver is priced globally. The spot price of silver is set globally, illegally, I might add, but it's still a global market. And you're playing on a global scale. You have international currency right now in your possession when you have silver, okay? So start thinking of it that way. Start thinking of how it's going to um, remove any limits to what you can do and where you can go because it's that global currency. You don't have to make any changes. In fact, I don't even go as far as to say you don't have to move into any new wealth cycles or transform your silver into another kind of currency, really, because in the end, silver is always going to have the most impact of any currency out there, simply because of the undervaluation and the manipulation that's gone on 150 years. It's going to affect people emotionally and visually all over the globe whenever you go to use it. So it would, should be the, the final um, trade you ever make when it comes to, you know, uh, transforming your currency. It is right. a global right. asset. It is, you know, intrinsically, like you said, uh, Silver Joker did void uh, and removed from typical global systems. This country began with silver, with gold. Right. So, you know, this this paper system that we're on, that's, that's what's new. Uh, the tried and true is uh, the precious metals based economy right. and think about this we already have precious metals already have that in place right now in the form of 90 percent silver and uh constitutional silver that's already it's already tailor-made for what 
is inevitable, I believe. Right. And I can tell you this, not only is a constitutional silver, you know, a very good, you know, silver choice and investment. I uh, plan on getting some more myself. Um, it is an indictment, actually, against the false premise that paper currency can actually function as money for a sovereign nation or even for the globe. The constitutional silver that's out there that's dated, that's minted, that is denominated and is available is an indictment to bad banking practices thinking that they could create money to infinity when in fact it's not money at all only silver is well absolutely i like the way you said that that's perfect that's exactly right the fact that that still remains the fact that we still have an abundance of constitutional silver is exactly what you said it's an indictment on the systems that was created to replace mm -hmm. that I, I like that. That's absolutely 100%. And, you know, and we're still going to use that, right? We use it now as just bullion, you know, just to have in our stacks, to give our stacks, you know, uh, more weight and fractional weight and, you know, alternatives and, and fluidity. Right. You know, that's what we have it for now. But I really believe, and I've said this in other videos, that eventually that is going to be used as currency, as barter uh, before too long. Now, I might not see it in my day because of my age, but I absolutely believe that at some point uh, that is you're going to be reverted back. And if not necessarily 90% silver, you will be using um, precious metals as currency, as money uh, in the future. Um, when the time comes, it'll take nothing for silver and gold to become money, to be used as money. You won't need a fiat blessing from a government for that to happen. It will happen organically on its own. And as long as people are willing to sell and buy and accept it, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening right now. It's going to happen a lot more right. in the future. The issue is, is that there's going to be a finite amount of it. And that's why governments hate gold and silver, because there's a finite amount of it. And it doesn't give them the ability to grow beyond their means, mm -hmm. to spend beyond their means. So if they are trying to uh, keep you away from it, but you can still get it, and you know it's going to be the currency of choice in the future, and it's going to release limits on you and put limits on government Why would you acquire it. I agree with that completely. And the thing is, is you got to ask yourself this. If if uh, the dollar was so much better than precious metals, then why are the big boys, why are the people like Buffett and some of the other really super rich people buying so much silver and gold? Why Why are they investing so much of their capital in silver and gold? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to wind this down, guys. Um, but before we go, we want to make sure that you understand, you know, share buybacks, um, they are an illusion of perceived wealth in companies. Unemployment is still picking up. Layoffs are still picking up. Um, government debt is still growing. Look at that clock. You can see it happening. Nothing is being fixed by it. So it's just piling on to a bad situation. All right. The solution is to turn anything you have monetarily that is made of smoke and mirrors, which we can see most of the stuff is, into something solid, okay? So share buybacks bad, silver good. Pretty much the uh, synopsis of it. Would you like to add anything to that, Silver Joker? Understand the urgency of stacking silver or coming up with some other means to protect yourself financially than just relying on right. uh, fiat currency. What you don't wanna do is you don't wanna have to sell off a lot of your silver to try to catch up with your basic needs when things go really bad. We are gonna have resource shortages, it's going to happen. You don't want to be those people that are in the mix with everybody else trying to get the things they need when there's almost nothing left and it's about too late. You want to be ahead of the game. That's what we stackers do. We're always two, three steps ahead of the game. Sometimes, in my case, 15 steps to get a little carried away. But I just want to make sure you guys are extreme to the upside so that when the downside happens and you come back to the mean, you're in good shape. That's going to do it for us today. Uh, this is Silver 5150 telling you that your stack is not whack and that just 15 ounces to your name keeps you 99% ahead of the game. The Silver Joker, what do you say? Let's just keep this silver train rolling, everybody. Keep stacking. All right. Choo-choo, guys, and we're out. Have a uh, great weekend. Have a great week. Continue stacking, and we'll see you later. Peace.